So I think we will kick off now. Um, good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to the penultimate event in our National Academic Integrity Week webinar series. Um, my name is Grania Mooney. I'm the Senior Communications Manager at QQI, and I'm also a member of the National Academic Integrity Network Steering Committee. I'm delighted to welcome our speaker today, Dr. Mary Davis. She is Academic Integrity Lead at Oxford Brookes University, and she has been teaching or researching academic integrity for almost 20 years, um, with a particular focus on educational and inclusive approaches. So Mary is a member of the Board of Directors for the International Centre for Academic Integrity and the co-chair of the International Day of Action for Academic Integrity, which took place just yesterday. And that makes us all the more grateful to have Mary today because she is coming off the back of a marathon 15 hour chairing session, which is no mean feat. <laughs> So today, um, Mary's going to discuss how we can include all students and staff in promoting and supporting academic integrity, how we can achieve greater inclusion through our policy procedures and practice, and also how we can incorporate, incorporate universal design for learning principles and much, much more. Uh, please feel free to submit any questions or comments you have in the chat. Um, Mary may pick up on some of these um, during her presentation, but we'll make sure um, to include these in the Q&A session at the end. So now I will hand over to you, Mary. Thank you very much, Brené, and also thank you, Sue, for inviting me. Uh, great to be with you today. Um, I do apologise for my voice. It is partly due to the 15 hour marathon hosting yesterday, but um, uh, also uh, just having a bad throat this week, unfortunately. OK, I'm going to share my screen. Let's hope that's working. That's OK, great. Let me just sort out my screen. Bear with me a second. OK, great. All right. So, um, yes, I'm talking to you about academic integrity for everyone. Um, in my view, it is just so important to make this everyone's responsibility and business and not just for a few people. And I'm going to talk about that and also about trying to be more inclusive in terms of approaches to uh, promoting and teaching academic integrity. So uh, just to give you a brief overview of the session, um, I'm going to start by looking at improving inclusion in institutional academic integrity policies. I know that uh, your uh, National Academic Integrity Network has worked a lot on uh, policies, um, uh, but I think the area of improving inclusion is really important. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit about an educational route that I was able to introduce at my institution, Oxford Brookes University, um, to try to uh, have more positive outcomes from academic conduct procedures um, where needed. Um, I'm going to talk about improving inclusion in different teaching resources and with that part of a, a project that I have led to um, develop uh, teaching resources that are inclusive and accessible and also uh, because of where we are now, uh, even um, almost a year since uh, the release of ChatGPT, we can't really ignore artificial intelligence in any session on academic integrity these days. So I will talk a little bit about that towards the end. Hope that sounds OK. So, um, you know, uh, I start with a very kind of general reminder about how academic integrity is central to everything and everyone at university. It's incredibly important for the student experience, um, but it also affects the staff experience. It's uh, really essential for student attainment, um, but also for their professional development. 
um, it's not a short term thing, it's it's uh, long term. It's really important for academic progression. And by that, I mean the progress of academic subjects as well as a student's progression and really important for institutional reputations to have good academic integrity policies, procedures and um, support. So there are many other areas, but those are some of the really crucial um, reminders about why academic integrity is so central. Um, but now I'm showing you kind of two sides of the spectrum. So I did some research over 10 years ago where I interviewed uh, members of staff <coughs> about what they did uh, in regard to academic integrity. And this quote, the first one here, um, was from a module leader who basically is saying, well, we don't have responsibility for this. We teach our subjects. Uh, what they called, we've got stuff to teach. And they didn't know whether there was really any teaching about um, academic integrity um, and, and didn't seem to see, there seemed to be a sort of disconnect. So they're focusing on their subject um, and feeling that academic integrity wasn't really something that they needed to be bothered about. And I expect there are many module leaders who still feel like that, um, but I think we need to convince them that academic integrity um, is part of a student's learning, whatever subject they're doing. And this is endorsed in the work of Laurie McNeil, um, really uh, inspiring work uh, that she did at the University of uh, British Columbia in Canada um, to try to really embed academic integrity instruction in all areas. So in um, every every course, every uh, subject that the students taking, embedding, talking and getting students to talk and learn about academic integrity. Now, um, AI, when she was writing, still meant academic integrity, not artificial intelligence. So um, that's, uh, you know, which is something I wanted to highlight. Um, now, in terms of involving everyone, I looked at uh, different um, policies from national bodies, international bodies, um, organisations, and these words, community, culture, everyone together, really stand out in all of these documents. So I started with your document that I know many people in Ireland use, the National Academic Integrity Network um, document uh, produced by QQI. And I notice um, this uh, need to raise awareness of academic integrity and encourage behaviours and attitudes which enable a culture of trust, openness and integrity. And I think those words are really, really important, really central to understanding this inclusive approach. Um, and there are parallels in almost any uh, document that is trying to um, get institutions to to approach academic integrity positively. So the International Centre for Academic Integrity that I'm um, on the board of directors of, uh, they say that uh, there is a need to educate all members of the community and create a culture of academic integrity. So again, really stressing the need to be inclusive and that it affects everyone. Um, and NI, the European Network for Academic Integrity, provide a really lovely definition of what a culture of academic integrity is. They say it is an organisational spirit and climate that informs and promotes ethical behaviour. Very uh, um, nicely written um, definition there. 
Um, QAA, our quality assurance agency in the UK, uh, state that everyone is responsible as part of a whole community approach. That's actually the very first thing they say at the beginning of the Academic Integrity Charter. Um, so, uh, again, really, really endorsing this message that we are all responsible. This, this is important for us all. And again, going back to um, the European Network for Academic Integrity, uh, their kind of tagline is getting higher education institutions to work together in the field of academic integrity. So I feel all everywhere we might look for guidance, for national or international guidance from these bodies, there's this emphasis on academic integrity being for everyone and the need to work together. So let's have a look at doing that um, in terms of improving inclusion in institutional academic integrity policies. I'm going to start by the, the impetus for me working on this um, in, in my context. I have been concerned for a long time about the overrepresentation of students from certain groups, particularly certain ethnic groups, including international students in academic uh, conduct investigations. That's been endorsed by other researchers, um, but looking at uh, some Oxford Brooks um, internal data, uh, what I found was that we have an international student body of about 15%. But the referrals, and by that I mean where a member of academic staff finds a possible academic conduct breach and refers it to the investigative team. So almost double the number in the student body, uh, the proportion uh, is almost double that were being referred. So that's already an alarm bell. And then tapping into the Asian and black data, um, looking at uh, the number in the student body, about 15 percent for um, Asian students, but 35 percent of the total referrals and uh, black students making up 6 percent of our student body, but 13 percent of student referrals. Now, if you do, if you add those up, you can see almost 50 percent of our referrals were for uh, Asian and black students, but they only represent 21 percent of the student body. So there's a massive overrepresentation. Something is going wrong um, and a an, an need to be um, more inclusive in approaches to academic integrity. Um, and uh, other support for a more inclusive approach from Ursula Wingate, um, making this point that academic literacy instruction isn't available to all students. So not all students are getting the uh, support and training. So that's an area to, to look at. And also in the work um, of Lynch and colleagues that, um, you know, one of the reasons uh, for poor decisions, it may come from the pressures experienced by certain groups of students. And a little bit more uh, about the the need uh, for being more inclusive. If we look at racial bias, so Tichy Vakunda in the US context found that black students were the most likely to report being accused of cheating. And uh, the inspiring work of Sarah Eaton, I know she's recently been in Ireland for your Galway conference, um, uh, has really tried to highlight the need to call out systemic racism in any faculty beliefs about students from certain ethnicities being more likely to cheat. And um, also from her work, a statement by the Alberta uh, Council on Academic Integrity requires staff to acknowledge any overrepresentation and address racial bias. I haven't yet talked about neurodiversity, but this is another group of students who may be disadvantaged by academic integrity policies and procedures and a need to be, uh, there is a strong need to be more um, inclusive in approaches. Um, the work of Brown and Lee in their ableism in academia um, 
volume have highlighted the need to be aware of this social model of disability. In other words, where the institution is disabling the student uh, as opposed to a medical model of disability. So institutions need to provide accessibility so they are not disabling students. Um, and uh, another issue is disclosure. So um, one statistic I found is that fewer than one in 20 students disclose. This is in the US context. It probably varies, but we know um, certainly in my institution that there is um, a lack of disclosure from many students who have a learning disability, uh, choose not to disclose it because of um, stigma or some perception of disadvantage or further problem. Um, research by Kinder and Alanda highlighted that students with dyslexia may have weaker authorial identities. In other words, being less confident about their voice and um, kind of putting themselves in writing, which creates uh, problems uh, with some assignments where they're uh, supposed to really be uh, demonstrating their own um, critical power and uh, critical thinking. And um, I have found in, in my research, which I'll start to talk about more in a moment, uh, that there are uh, significant problems for some neurodiverse students in understanding uh, academic integrity documents, processes, and they may feel abandoned by their tutors. Now, another group of students, um, and I believe you also use this term, the widening participation group. So students who are first in family or um, come from a lower socioeconomic level or a, an area with low participation in higher education. Um, so uh, students um, uh, in uh, this, uh, this sort of position um, may not may feel they have no one to help them to navigate higher education. They may have had limited or negative experiences of prior education and prior education is always something to take into account with academic integrity. I think it can have a very important influence. Um, and then uh, research by Fudge and colleagues at in Australia. Um, and they found looking at um, I think they were nursing students that some unintentional academic conduct breaches uh, from this group of widening participation students um, were due to gaps in learning or a low level of academic uh, language um, and other issues like a reluctance to engage with university systems and fear of outcomes. So all of these issues, again, should be alarm bells. The institutions need to do more to support uh, these uh, groups of students. And um, I have certainly found that there is a need for opportunities to engage um, students and give them uh, opportunities to practice before assessment and to prioritise education. So going into my research now, um, which I published last year in the International Journal for Education and Integrity. Uh, what I did was I analysed the kinds of documents that we have at my institution about academic integrity, so including um, the, uh, the breaches and guidance for students. I interviewed staff who had key um, academic integrity roles and I also interviewed students and the students um, uh, in my interviews who had experienced academic conduct investigations. That was my really key data that were those were the um, interviews that really made a difference and enabled me to um, make some changes. So um, I'm going to show you a bit of that data, uh, some of the interview data. Um, so the first uh, comment here was from an international student participant in my research. And if you have a look at it, 
I think it really uh, shows very powerfully how some students can be in a kind of trap. So, um, you know, the kind of guidance they're getting is check this site. But many students, if you tell them that, um, actually don't know what they're supposed to do, what they're supposed to pick up on without further guidance. So I, I have stopped doing that now. When I um, share information with students, I now, I'm now really careful, especially if they're at an early stage of their studies, to help them navigate that site. So I'm not just telling them, look there, but telling them, OK, on this site, you will find this, this and this. So, you know, this this student had a, a, a big effect on um, my practices. Uh, but what I wanted to highlight here is this student feeling that as a master student, they should know, but they don't and they can't ask. So it really um, highlights that uh, students can feel in this sort of trap that they that they should know already. And, and so we've got to make it easier for them to feel it's OK to ask, it's OK to get support. The support is here for you. It doesn't matter what level you're at. You can always get support and, and guidance. And then the other comment here is from a member of teaching staff. Um, and I notice here that they're highlighting particular nationalities. And I think we've got to be a bit careful, like, you know, it's, it's important to know perhaps where you need to give more support, but it's also important not to stereotype any any group of students say, well, that group are going to have problems um, because we've got to uh, change the narrative there to to be more inclusive and, and supportive. Now, looking at um, uh, students with uh, disability, particularly um, dyslexia. So um, one of my participants identified as having dyslexia and connects their diagnosis with feeling, well, they just can't do their work and can't do sort of deal with academic um, conduct issues. And that, again, was a, was a really powerful statement. Um, I also found out from the librarian that sometimes they have found that students who are dyslexic are afraid to come into the library, um, feeling you know, it's it's not a place for them or they don't belong there. Um, and the academic conduct investigator here highlighting that, you know, um, they really feel that the investigation isn't good for students with mental health issues and disabilities. Uh, it can really mess up their, their year and, and doesn't seem a, a good way forward. And then looking at the widening participation, I had one of my participants um, who uh, identified as coming from this group uh, saying that they feel um, it's really overwhelming um, to deal with the complexity of some documents when you've been out of education uh, for a while, trying to take in what you're supposed to do and not supposed to do. Um, again, that was was very enlightening. And then uh, the academic development staff. So this is the, the team that we have who support students with um, academic integrity through training and tutorials, etc. Uh, this again, I think it's, this is a, a, a really insightful comment from them um, looking at another trap. So uh, if you fit the profile of a widening participation student, you may feel you, you that um, or you may not feel that you deserve to be there. Or you might feel you don't belong. And that means you don't ask for help. And then you know, you're trying to fly under the radar, not be noticed. And then that leads you to be more likely to mess up, to have some problem with uh, academic integrity. And then again, you experience that problem, but you still don't ask for help. So it's a kind of dark, downward spiral, I would say, for a student in that position. And, and really insightful to think about what may be going on for these students. Um, and, and the need to, again, reach out to them, help them feel that they belong at university 
and support them rather than making things sort of impossible or, or, or too difficult for them to navigate. Uh, so just a sort of roundup of problems uh, with support. So, um, I mean, one session at induction can mean that late arrivals, particularly students who are delayed by visas, if they're international students, they may miss that key instruction. Um, uh, it seems often that the support that students get isn't individualised and therefore um, students may not have an opportunity for questions or other students this this issue of face um, uh, feeling that they should already know and they, they can't sort of admit that they don't know um, or not having time to practice uh, that, that seems to be another factor um, documents that are only given as links uh, or are very long and unengaging so that's uh, very uninclusive and um, as I was kind of saying in earlier research, there is a need to provide continuous teaching of academic practice throughout students' courses. Uh, yeah, thanks for picking up on that, Sue. Um, uh, we should also remember our, our sort of context in, in terms of um, legal requirements. Um, so this is for the UK, but I'm sure there are uh, similar requirements in Ireland to be inclusive. So um, all of the statement that we have in terms of our Equalities Act about universities needing to ensure learning, teaching and assessment practices promote inclusive curricula, equal opportunities and eliminate discrimination. If we're saying that is what must be applied to education, then it it stands to reason that must also be applied to academic integrity, which is part of education. And educational resources must be fully accessible. This is something um, in our um, national uh, government guidance that is uh, taken very seriously. Resources must be fully accessible. So uh, again, a really important point um, in terms of the way academic integrity is taught. And uh, at the same time, our Office for Students is saying uh, institutions are obliged to act on attainment gaps. I think there is a clear link between uh, the attainment gaps for certain groups and academic conduct problems. Of course, if a student is experiences academic conduct problems, they're less, less likely to get a good degree. It's going to affect their um, overall attainment. And so if we must act on attainment gaps, we must do more to support students with learning about academic integrity. Um, I uh, was uh, very inspired by the work of uh, Liz Thomas and Helen May in this Advanced HE study, where they define inclusion as a means of making higher education accessible, relevant and engaging to all students. I really like that choice of words because um, accessible, making sure that every student can access it and understand it, relevant, making sure that um, you know it, it makes sense to that student. They can see the, the point of it in terms of their study and engaging, meaning they really want to do it. They want to uh, learn about it. So motivating as well. I think all of those words are really important. Uh, and I've tried to sort of adopt as my mantra with any work that I'm doing on academic integrity education. Um, I said I'd talk about policy, so I just want to go uh, next to uh, the seminal work of Tracy Brittag and, and colleagues to identify the five uh, principles of uh, exemplary academic integrity policy, which I think we should always remember. The, the first one's about access, making sure that uh, any policy is in an easy to access location, but also it's accessible in terms of language and format. Um, the approach should be educative. Responsibility is for everyone. Uh, there should be enough detail to enable students to understand and 
um, sufficient support. Um, so that all of that is uh, really important um, to bear in mind. Um, Tracy Britterg and colleagues uh, provided these guidelines uh, more than 10 years ago when Universal Design for Learning, I don't think, had actually been developed. Um, but much of this connects up with Universal Design for Learning, and I'm going to come on to that in a moment. Um, so accessibility. And uh, Mairead, I've seen your, your point. I will uh, comment on that as we go, I think. Um, so uh, policies. Um, so even more than 20 years ago, Diane Pecorari was highlighting that um, often academic integrity policies are hidden. They're hidden in long documents and they're hidden in places where students' attention is not drawn to. So how can we expect them to know about them? And uh, access to policies requires perseverance. <laughs> so uh, work of uh, Brenda Sturz and uh, colleagues in Canada, uh, they, they found um, on average to get into an academic integrity policy, a student's got to do 3.5 clicks from the home page. And I found, yeah, it's pretty much the same with, with um, ours. So you might like to test that out on your own policy. How accessible is it? And uh, Texa, uh, doing amazing work in Australia, of course, they um, highlight the need to make policy easy to locate and read and make it concise and comprehensible. And the QAA, uh, very similar, saying it, it must be as clear as possible. So we've got lots of guidance telling us what to do. Um, we've got to think about how we do it. Um, so these are the documents that I investigated. So we have a letter that we send to students if they are in a possible breach, academic conduct breach situation. Uh, we have our academic conduct breaches document. We have a procedure and um, advice document. So they are the main four documents that I looked at. And then, as I said, uh, I uh, used the Universal Design for Learning guidelines. I'm sorry, I'm sure that's rather small on your um, screen, uh, but I've just highlighted comprehension, which I will show you. So comprehension is under the what of learning because Comprehension to me is the really essential thing. Um, there's so many important points about learning here, but comprehension is is just essential for anything to do with academic integrity. So um, the uh, guidelines for that, which hopefully is big enough for you to see here, there are four uh, checkpoints. Um, activate or supply background knowledge highlight patterns, critical features, big ideas and relationships, and guide information processing and visualization, maximize transfer and generalization. So um, what uh, the Universal Design for Learning guidelines are doing there is, is sort of highlighting the, the essential elements that anything we want students to comprehend, um, that, that we cover those, those points. And so what I did using, these are the four points, across the top row here, the universal design for learning features of comprehension. And then I mapped our policy to these particular points of comprehension. And this second row here um, it are my comments on the academic conduct breaches, the sorts of things that um, uh, I, I observe that could be OK or could be problematic. And then this bottom row here are my recommendations to provide uh, revisions. So just to briefly talk through some of this, um, in terms of activating or supplying knowledge, I noticed the first thing that the document did was um, warn them that they could be expelled or lose their degree. Um, so in terms of background knowledge, I felt that's that's a really harsh way to start a document um, and it only contained one link to a procedure. So my recommendation was to add links to all the documents and focus on good practice as a way into uh, this policy. 
Um, in terms of highlighting patterns, I noticed that they used a bold text for the names of the breaches. They stated that there's a library uh, a leaflet, but there was no link to it and a mention of the procedure, but again, no link. So here I'm suggesting links to all of this and linking to support. In terms of guiding information processing and overall, I felt this is really crucial, maybe most important of all the four. Uh, so what I noticed is the title was in a large black box. So again, kind of a scary approach, like the warning you could be expelled um, was the way that this started. The breaches were bizarrely listed with Roman numerals. I think this is a, a link to sort of making a, a legal approach to it. And, and it also had some legal terms like fraud and contain some repetition. So my recommendations were remove the black box, re replace the Roman numerals with standard numbers. That's also what students told me. Some students had no idea what three eyes in a row was, was uh, meant to mean. Uh, removing the legal terms, the repetition and using consistent terms as well. And then in terms of maximising transfer, one good thing I noticed is that it did link to the UK Academic Integrity Charter from QAA, but that wasn't linked in other documents. So my recommendation, add consistent links to all the documents and provide some teaching resources and examples so students could maximise their transfer to uh, um, apply this understanding to. So I'm really glad to say that um, as I'm academic integrity lead and um, uh, was able to use the research that I'd done to make the case for this, um, I was able to make all of those changes so that our policies do follow universal design for learning principles. And I'd encourage anyone looking at policies to think about engaging with the universal design for learning principles in the policy. Um, yeah, so uh, that's perhaps a few quick reflections you might like to think about. I won't dwell on those now. Um, uh, Mermaid, about policy title. Yeah, I, I forgot to mention that, but the policy title, I did say it used to be called definitions of cheating and now we call them academic conduct breaches. Uh, it's part of making the uh, policies and all the, the terms we use consistent. Because I noticed that, you know, they were calling this cheating, but then um, the the within each one, they were called breaches. So um, I, I think academic conduct breaches is um, a sort of a, a better term in terms of uh, highlighting what it really is. It's a breach. Um, I mean, we can still talk about cheating behaviours, but I think it's more helpful certainly to be, uh, well, it's essential to be consistent and it fitted more with how it's dealt with elsewhere. So I think I need to uh, uh, try and speed up a little bit now. Um, so uh, another thing that I've been able to do is create an educational route. Now, coming back to uh, some of that data I shared at the beginning about overrepresentation. I think I forgot to mention that uh, those students who um, were overrepresented, particularly uh, the Asian and Black students, um, uh, the majority had a minor breach. And therefore, for minor breaches, it doesn't seem appropriate to have um, a, a whole investigation. Um, and this has also been supported by the research of others. Uh, I've always uh, used this quote from Betty Leask in the Australian context, a reminder that, you know, if students don't understand the concept, if students don't know what to do or they just can't do what they have to do, no deterrent will be effective. There's no point threatening them with being expelled or losing marks if we don't actually teach them how to do it. Uh, so I think that's really important to remember. And then further endorsement here of the need for educational approaches, especially where uh, any breach is unintentional or minor. So this is what I did just very briefly. 
um, what I was able to do is change our procedure, our academic conduct procedure, which previously would only be either uh, once referred, the uh, student would uh, face an investigation or the team would decide no case and therefore no investigation. Um, uh, what I was able to bring in this, this green route here, educational route, is if a student is in their first year of study, whatever course they're doing, so whether it's foundation, undergraduate, postgraduate, but their first year of study at our institution, if they have a minor breach, a first minor breach, then there's no investigation and they just go through an educational route, which is compulsory. They do have to complete it. Um, first stage is a, an online course taking about one hour uh, self-study. And then second stage is a one hour training session with the academic and uh, academic development team um, in a small group of probably about uh, eight students. Um, and then there's further optional training. But this seems to be really working. Um, kind of latest statistics, about 11% of uh, breaches um, are now going through that route, which really caters for many of the first minor breaches that we were getting from those overrepresented groups. Um, so building inclusion together, we really do need to work together uh, as a collective effort, we need a proper work allocation. Um, we need to work together to rectify overrepresentation and build student agency into academic integrity. Improving inclusion in teaching, I'm just going to briefly highlight the work that um, I have done uh, for a QAA funded project. I led this collaborative enhancement project between my institution, Oxford Brooks, with Bloomsbury Institute London, University of Southampton and University of Westminster. And uh, we work together um, using the Universal Design for Learning principles as a group who were academic integrity experts and inclusion experts, so important, um, and student union officers and students. That was our project team, ensuring that all voices are heard um, and then we put together a whole lot of uh, resources. You're very welcome to use those. This was our definition of inclusion. And I would just highlight uh, how important we felt was inclusion involves celebrating differences. So not um, taking a, a, a negative approach. We were trying to be as positive as possible um, in our way of including everyone. Uh, we developed a student academic integrity champion model um, to try to help uh, institutions establish a system of uh, student academic integrity champions. I won't go through all that. And these are our teaching resources. Please do use them. They're open access, downloadable and in various formats so that they can be used by everyone. I'll pop a link in uh, to the chat. Uh, for these, that those are the resources to use with students, which involve uh, games and discussions and simulations, and uh, these resources for staff as well. Uh, this is one of our resources for staff, which is our partners checklist. Uh, again, I won't go into the details, but it looks a bit like this. We have a whole lot of questions to ask um, to try to help any a uh, staff member who's developing academic integrity resources to be accessible and inclusive. Uh, inclusion in the age of AI. Now, given the time, I know I've got to uh, do this very quickly, but um, yeah, various questions we might think about whether uh, the current age of artificial intelligence is an opportunity to be more inclusive or if it's actually excluding more students. I think um, what I can establish is it seems both things are happening. It might be inclusive in some ways, but it's actually uh, creating more disadvantages in some ways. Uh, the work of Brenda McDermott, she spoke yesterday as well at our International Day of Action. Um, 
is highlighting the need to note that, you know, if your procedure is saying students can't use artificial intelligence for something, you've got to be very careful in terms of students who are using assistive technology um, as part of a support plan. Um, you know, if uh, they have dyslexia or um, another uh, form of neurodiversity, then we should not be um, disadvantaging them in any policy. I um, quickly want to show you another thing I've been doing with Universal Design for Learning principles. So there they are again, those principles of um, comprehension. I use them again to develop a resource to try and help students with artificial intelligence. So I've made a course that students take at my institution now um, to try and help them to make good decisions in terms of appropriate use at risk and inappropriate use. So, yeah, um, I heard someone say that they really cringe at the traffic light model the other day, a member of staff, but um, the feedback I've had from students, at least, has been really positive. I use traffic lights because I'm just conscious that um, we needed a really easy model to try to help students navigate at the moment. I'm really conscious that we're likely to have to update our guidance very soon because artificial intelligence is not a, a sort of a stable thing. The development is going so fast, we need to keep making improvements. But what I also felt was there was a really urgent need to try to help students to make good decisions in terms of using artificial intelligence, in terms of understanding ethical use. So I developed this model, I used universal design for learning principles, and so far it seems to be going pretty well. I have an exercise where I give examples, and these are real examples because we've had a declaration system in place since the beginning of the year. So I'm using real examples to uh, get students to decide, well, what does that sound like? Explaining keywords to check your understanding, would that be OK? Um, and then they can choose appropriate, at risk or inappropriate. And then with each answer, they get guidance. So what I've tried to do in all the guidance is include some caution. So, uh, OK, you might say explaining keywords is appropriate. But don't forget that AI tools work by predicting text, so they may generate some inaccurate information. So it's not unethical to check keywords, but there is a risk that the information may not be accurate. Yeah, so that's my example and practice. Uh, last thing I'm going to talk about um, is yesterday. Um, so we had this International Day of Action for Academic Integrity. Um, and you can access the recordings via the International Centre for Academic Integrity website. In a couple of days, we had 18 sessions, 15 hours. I hosted the whole thing, hence I might look a bit tired today. We had 59 speakers, 32 students and attendees from 20 countries. We had a great session from Monica Ward from uh, Dublin City University with Owen Crossan. Um, and uh, I know some other Irish uh, colleagues like uh, Deirdre McClay was there. Um, please do join us next year and uh, please contribute next year. If you're interested, please get in touch. But uh, it was an opportunity for inclusion, joining up and having uh, international collaboration. So some final thoughts for you, um, but please do continue the conversation um, anytime. I'm happy to hear from you. I'm sorry to overrun a bit in terms of my speaking time. Um, I've obviously gone uh, a bit too slow, but I'm happy to take any questions now. I'll just quickly show you my references and then stop sharing. Mary, stop that sharing. was fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. And and sore throat aside, um, it sounds like you could you had more that you could have talked about <laughs> to us there, and more that we would have been happy to listen to. Um, that that's really useful, you know, from 
the insights into the student motivations and the challenges, how that that disadvantage can exist on so many different levels um, yeah. in ways that we don't fully appreciate. And and then coming right through into, you know, all those really practical, implementable actions that you've shared with us. It's, it's almost like, a, you know, an AI policy in a box in a way. So <laughs> I, I think everybody will have found that um, really, really useful. Um, so I'm going to just um, look at some of the questions that have popped in and I'll work my way back up through them. So um, let's see. So we have a question here from Philip Wende. Um, what type of ethical clearance did you require to access records and interview the students who had gone through academic integrity investigation? Yeah. Uh, nice question, because I know this is the barrier to so many um, uh, bits of research about this. Um, so uh, I uh, my institution also is really tough on ethics, so it did take me quite a while. I had to um, be uh, really careful in terms of my recruitment methods. Um, and uh, I had to, for example, I was only able to recruit students. So I'm just going to drop in a, a link to those resources I talked about. Um, I was only able to recruit students who, after an investigation, um, contacted the academic development team for support, and then they were given a flyer. So that already reduced the possible pool that I could draw on. because It was only students who were looking for follow up support. And then obviously only if they uh, uh, were comfortable. So that's why I only had three. But nevertheless, they gave me my richest data and uh, really uh, helped me to then have enough sort of weight behind um, uh, what I was uh, saying in my research to be able to change policy. But yeah, there was a lot of ethical the scrutiny um, and uh, in terms of records and numbers and that kind of thing, I work very closely with the um, student investigation team and I produce reports myself. So I'm actually uh, completely involved in all of that as academic integrity lead. Hey, so we have another question from Billy Kelly. Um, who's our chair of our, our network. Um, how successful have you been in getting staff to take up the lessons of your research and what has been most effective in this? Uh, getting staff. So um, uh, I suppose uh, in, in my position, because I am uh, academic integrity lead, um, I, uh, I have a I don't know how best to describe it. Certain amount of clout anyway. I can um, I provide a lot of updates and guidance uh, is part of my role is is to actually uh, do staff training. Um, and I try to make it as accessible, encouraging and positive as possible. So that's my approach to staff um, and also always to listen to their uh, queries. So you can imagine I have quite a lot of meetings with with staff one to one as well, because, um, you know, I want to ensure that um, I'm inclusive to staff as well. And and I try to demystify academic integrity, I think, for staff as well as students. Quite often there's a sense that it's, it's too complicated or, um, you know, leave it to somebody else or you know, uh, I, I don't really want to engage with it. So if we try to demystify it, I think that also can really help in terms of staff engagement. I'm not claiming a 100% success rate, though. I recognise that maybe um, uh, for, for some staff, they would still rather just kind of try to uh, keep it to the periphery and um, uh, uh, engage more only when there's a problem, but I have really, really tried to change the narrative so it's not academic misconduct that everyone's focused on, but academic integrity as a learning goal. Right. 
Um, we've also had a couple of queries there. Um, attendees asking if um, the slides will be shared. And yes, yes, that's absolutely happy, fine. Yeah. And if you're happy for people to um, use those and reference um, your work in, of in their, their own work. No yeah, problem. Brilliant. Yeah, sorry, I didn't see great. that. No, uh, no, it's yes, fine. The, the, I'd be delighted the for you to use my work. Uh, anyone who is at this meeting, thank you very much for your interest. And uh, please That's do. Great. And uh, also the resources, as I said, you can download any of the teaching resources um, from the from the website. Okay. We have a question here from Yvonne Kavanagh. Um, yeah. uh, if the students go the educational route, is their student number recorded in case of another future breach? Yeah, uh, yeah, so uh, yes, it is. So um, because at the moment we're only offering it to students with a first minor breach, if they have a second minor breach, then they would go through an investigative route. So yes, it is recorded. So basically the investigative team and the academic development team um, join up and, and share um, the data. Okay. Um, we have another question from Sue to say, asking, is there a policy piece on supporting staff to avoid breaches or is it all part of the same one? Uh, a policy brief for staff? Sorry, I'm yes. not sure I fully understood that. Yeah, it's uh, is there a policy piece on supporting staff to avoid breaches or is it all part of the same one? So. Shall I jump in? Yeah. Grania? Yes, Sue, uh, that would be yeah. great. Thank you. OK, <laughs> sorry, what, Sue. What I meant was, is there a is there a staff policy around um, upholding their academic integrity and avoiding uh, breaches of misconduct as um, we've you've talked about the, the one for students or is it all part of the same policy? So do you mean staff in their research um, or do you mean the staff support of students? I really meant staff in their in their jobs. Mm, that's very interesting because, uh, yeah, I, I think that's um, I mean, it is sort of implicit when we say um, everyone at the institution but it isn't specifically highlighted. So that's a very interesting point you've raised there, Sue. Is that something that um, QQI has has highlighted about how staff well, follow academic integrity? I suppose the name rather than QQI would be sort name, of um, sorry, yes. supporting staff in um, managing, understanding, raising awareness and therefore being able to, you know, uphold their own integrity, so to speak, academic integrity. But yeah. um, we're also aware of the, you know, the cheating industry out there bombarding staff with offers to share their programmes, to share yeah. their, you know, old exams and all that sort of thing. Yeah, um, I think we, that, that may be uh, you. You may have highlighted a gap there because I think we, with staff, we focused more on research ethics and uh, you know research integrity um, rather than thinking you know of the guidance to staff to make sure that they um, they're acting with integrity in in terms of. Uh, teaching and uh, 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 not, you know, responding to the kind of thing you just mentioned. Right, uh, OK. That's a good point. Thank you. And thanks, Sue. Um, I'm conscious we've we've come up to time and um, we just have, I think we have a couple of questions in the chat that probably were you answered. So one was from Anne Gilday here in QQI around resistance to change amongst teachers within institutions to the, the implementation of these policies. Um, but uh, I, I think you covered that off. Um, Maria Boland had a question around changing policy title um, and what your view is on the impact of terminology and framing yeah. the issue positively versus negatively. On yeah, so important engagement. to do that, I think. Yeah, that really makes a difference to how um, how staff and students view it um, and, you know, 
so many people say this, but I, I feel it, it always needs to have attention drawn to it, that we we need to make it clearer what students need to do, not just what they mustn't do. Right. We need to focus on, you know, what is good practice? What is academic integrity rather than, you know, don't plagiarise all the things that, you know, that students mustn't do because they're breaches. I think what has happened for a long time, there's been so much attention on, you know, what not to do. We've got to focus more on what students need to do so that we then um, help them to be able to do those things. And it's not just about avoiding um, breaches and problems. Absolutely. And I, I think that's the message that's come through so strongly in your presentation. and in previous presentations this week from the learners is really about centering ourselves, I think, um, at the heart of the, the learner experience to really yeah. understand how they engage with all this, you know, and grapple with um, academic integrity and, and really meeting the students where they are, um, rather than yeah. expecting them to behave um, and understand like we do. So I think all your presentation today, all the, those pointers and tips, I think are going to be so helpful for all the listeners and hopefully everybody who listens on YouTube um, after after the event. Um, so I'd just like to thank you again very much, Mary, for so generously sharing your, your time and your expertise and wisdom today. And um, I hope you can now go and rest your, your vocal <laughs> cords and take a break, but it's very much appreciated and thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. And thanks so much to um, all the uh, attendees. It's been really nice sharing practice with you. Thank you.